Welcome to Season 2 of Archeo Ed, a podcast about the ancient civilizations of the Americas. I'm your host, Dr. Ed Barnhart. For the last 30 years, I've been all over the Americas as an archeologist, an explorer, and a seeker of esoteric knowledge. This podcast is just me, freed from the lecture podium and talking with you like we're just having a beer together. Sometimes it'll be very in-depth information about a particular subject. Other times it'll be very general information about a wide subject. Basically, it'll be anything I feel like talking about, because this is my podcast and I'm just having fun with it. I hope you enjoy it too. And without further ado, let's get started. Season 2, Episode 5, Mashna Part 2, and Other Tales. So, back by popular demand, this episode will be about the rest of my adventures at Mashna. While trying to recall all those events that happened now, 25 years ago, I realized that they're entwined with a whole lot of other things that were happening in my emerging archaeology career. So this story will be about Mashna, but it'll also be about the other exciting things that happened to me during that time of life. Now, last episode ended with the initial discovery of the city of Mashna, but I realized that I forgot to tell one good story from that moment, that time when I lost six students in the jungle. So first, let me back up and tell you about that snafu. In the final days of the 1995 program for Belize season, I had found Mashna, and everybody wanted to see it. Normally, I had at most six students with me, but now Fred decided to send me 20. At the start of the five-kilometer hike, I put my seasoned students who knew the way up in front, and I brought up the rear with Doc Charles. The logging road was marked with flagging tape, but so were a bunch of other exploratory lines we had cut. It was easy to follow the wrong one. The group got really spread out, mainly because my students were showing off how fast they could walk up the trail. By the time I arrived to the site, they were casually sitting around looking cool. I did a quick head count, and to my shock, we were missing six students. I was furious, but there was no time to be mad. I told a student named Briar that she was in charge and barked for Jim to follow me. We took off back down the trail at a run, yelling the names of the students. There was no telling how long they had been lost or how far they had gotten. The most logical point was where the trail to Mashna took a sharp right at a place where another trail continued straight. We ran to the end of that one, yelling, but no students. And as we backtracked, still yelling, we heard something crashing through the woods to our right. We stopped to listen, but nothing. So we ran again, and we heard it again. We stopped and just stared at each other for a long moment. Then I quietly said, We've been running through the forest, wailing like hurt animals. I don't think either one of us dared say it, but we were thinking the same thing. Oh crap, that could be a jaguar. We looked around and rather futilely picked up some big sticks and then just kept running. No jaguar ever emerged, but I'm pretty damn sure it was there. They're sneaky and cheeky like that. And anyway, we had no time for a jaguar attack. We had lost students to find. Running about another kilometer, we finally found a note. It said, we are lost, and named all six missing students. It said, we will follow this flagging tape to try to get back to the road. The tape they referred to marked my old western transect. Oh, great. Now we were running up and down hills. It was about that time when Jim and I ran completely out of water, and that was dangerous. Heat stroke was inevitable if we didn't get more. My decision? We would find those students and share their water when we did. Running onward, we found another note, 
but this time with only five names. But we later learned that that was just an omission, thank goodness. Anyway, we chased them all the way out to the main PFB road. When we arrived, parched and exhausted, we found a final note which read, Fred was driving by and picked us all up. See you back at camp. Staring at each other once again, red-faced and sweaty, we realized that our next sip of water was five kilometers away, uphill, at Mashna. We just walked real slow, trying not to pass out, all the way back up to Mashna, and we made it. In the end, everyone was okay, but poor Jim and I ran and walked 25 kilometers that day. That night, we were both asleep before dinner. That fiasco aside, I returned to grad school in the fall feeling pretty good about myself. Linda Sheely had just published her most popular book, Maya Cosmos, and that fall's seminar was all about the astronomy in the Dresden Codex. I was enthralled by the subject, and I can point to that class as the start of my career as an archaeoastronomer. But also during that seminar, I managed to make a major discovery within the Dresden Codex, a hidden pattern of the mathematics of its first 23 pages. Sheely loved what I did, and it became my master's thesis. If you'd like to know more about it, that master's thesis is free for download on Mech's website, and it's called Groups of Four and Five Day Names in the First 23 Pages of the Dresden Codex. I'll put a link to it in the show notes of this episode. Also during that fall, I had struck up a friendship with another of Sheely's students, Christopher Powell. We wrote a paper about the Dresden Codex Venus pages together, and like me, he had been staff at another project in Belize. Then over Christmas break that year, an amazing thing happened. It was just about midnight on Saturday night. My brother and I were watching Saturday Night Live when the phone rang. Sure, it was one of my buddies. I picked it up with a sassy, yellow, and it was Linda Sheely. She said, Ed, how'd you like to work at Copan? And I said, absolutely. She said, can you leave next month? And I said, yes. She said, okay, I'll send you the details on Monday. You and Christopher Powell will both go. And then she hung up. Dumbfounded, I put down the phone, looked at my brother Fred, and said, I'm going to Honduras. So just three weeks later, I flew down to Merida to meet Christopher. He had driven his truck down to Yucatan and was working for a foundation there. We drove through Yucatan, Belize, Guatemala, and finally to Copan, visiting ruins all along the way. The roads were terrible, but the sights were fantastic. For the next four months, we worked for Bob Scher and David Sadat of the University of Pennsylvania, the whole time in the tunnels underneath Copan. There was also a Harvard project going on, so Christopher and I found ourselves lone Texans working with a bunch of Ivy League grad students. At first, I thought I should straighten up and be professional. No more of that Cinnabar nonsense. But it turned out, that they were the sickest group of partiers I've ever met. Every single night was a party at the Tunkul bar in town. In fact, I can't even tell most of those stories, lest I defame people who are now respected professors. But the field work was amazing. Under David Sadat's brilliant leadership, we found the tomb of Copan's founding king, Yash Kuk Mo, and his wife. It made international news. National Geographic came down. It was a huge deal. Maybe someday I'll do an episode about those days too, but for now it's about time I get back to Mashna. So after the Copan field season, Christopher offered to drive me back to Belize so I could show him the site. He was on his way back to Yucatan anyway. But just before I left Copan, one of the Ivy League students showed me something in the internet cafe that surprised me an ad for a field school at Mashna. It was to be run by two ladies from New England that I had never heard of. What was going on? I needed to talk to Fred Valdez. Okay, I'll take a commercial break here. When I return, I'll tell you about my third season at Mashna. Hey 
Hey folks, I hope that most of you know by now that I've published a Maya Calendar iPhone app. But now I'm happy to announce that I've added a fun new feature, the ability to email friends their Maya birth date and associated horoscope. The Maya believe that your birth date shapes your personality and destiny. And my app was already showing you that. But now, you can plug in a friend's birthday and email, and for a small fee, send them their own digital copy. It's a great little birthday gift, or you could just send it for fun. You can find the app on the Apple App Store as Maya Calendar by me, Edwin Barnhart. Check it out. Okay, I'm back. So Christopher drove me to program for Belize with about a week to go before the field school started. He stayed on a few days, and I hiked him out to Mashna to show him around. Oh, for the days when a 10-kilometer hike through the jungle was something I did for fun. Fred Valdez showed up with the students in early May. As soon as I could, I asked him about the Mashna field school I had heard rumor of in Copan. And it was true. He explained that two archaeologists named Leslie Shaw and Eleanor King had a big grant to contribute to the project in exchange for a place to run a field school of their own. And Fred gave them Mashna. I could work at the site until June, and then they would take over. He suggested that I could continue surveying west towards the Guatemalan border. In retrospect, I could have been a lot more diplomatic about it, but I wasn't. In fact, I was vocally pissed off. I was angry with Fred and not too interested in helping Sean King at all. Sean King responded by never mentioning me in any of their publications. The closest they ever came is saying that students of Fred Valdez discovered Mashna. Nowadays, I consider it an important life lesson. You really do catch more flies with honey than vinegar. And I know what I did, and so do all the people with me those years. But at the moment of May 1996, I now had six weeks to make the best of my remaining time at Mashna. I had already established two main goals for the season. One, to cut the logging road out all the way to the site so we could get trucks in. And two to establish a grid across the site so we could systematically survey and map it. Fred gave me six students and a couple of Belizean hired workers to cut the road, and a big brown Ford truck, which we affectionately called the Hoss. I loved the Hoss. It was the toughest truck at PFB and the only one that could handle the road cutting job. For the first week, the camp manager, Oscar, came with us to get the road cutting started and on track. I loved Oscar, too. He was strong, smart, and knew how to fix anything. He also knew a ton about the jungle. He could go from gut laughing to serious as a heart attack in a split second. Even the slightest jungle noise could put him on red alert. Oscar was also very superstitious. It was from him that I first learned about La Llorona, Duendes, and a monster named La Susia, who could transform herself into looking like people you knew or loved. The one thing La Susia couldn't change were her ugly turkey legs. If you didn't see them in time and she got close enough, she'd eat your face. Oscar had a thousand stories like that, and he was a pleasure to work with. Anyhow, we'd drive the truck up to the farthest place we had cut, and then we'd leave Oscar and the crew to keep cutting as we walked the rest of the way to the site. The road was all cut in about three weeks, and the Belizean workers went off to help at other sites. Now, every day began with a hair-raising ride in the hoss, crashing through the jungle and yelling, Duck! out the back window multiple times along the way. At the site, the first thing we did is establish the survey grid. We picked a zero-zero point in the main plaza and then cut north-south and east-west lines out for hundreds of meters. Then off that, we cut more lines, establishing a grid of 100-meter squares. 
Once we had that, we could intensively search each block for smaller buildings and other features. But even as we cut the grid, we made an important discovery. The site was pretty dense, buildings everywhere. But just to the west of the main plaza was an area that dipped down and then back up with absolutely no buildings. After we crossed it a few times, north-south and east-west, we realized what it was. It was a big reservoir right at the heart of the site. I had seen this kind of thing in Tikal, but didn't expect it at Mashna. It made me think, geez, how big is this site? And honestly, I still don't know. I left in 1997 with a lot more mapping to do. There's more out there. To the south, we discovered a neighborhood full of big elite housing compounds. They were built high up off the jungle floor, with four buildings and a raised patio between. One of them had a looter's trench going back into a tomb. There was a huge burial urn at the back, emptied of its contents. But the urn itself was probably too heavy for the looters to take. Being a student of Sheely's, what I really wanted to find this season was a carved stela, something with glyphs that I could translate myself. And we did find one. It was one by two meters in size and about a half a meter thick, laying fallen in the jungle near the main plaza. We brushed off the top, but it was completely eroded. But it could have had carving protected on the other side. All we had to do was flip it, right? Well, it turns out that was a lot harder than it sounded. We cut down four trees as poles and dug them under the stela. With all our strength, we lifted it about two inches. Eventually, we cut another four poles and took turns, with four lifting and four repositioning to lift a little more. After about four hours of that, we finally flipped it. And there was nothing. No carving. It was eroded on that side, too. So, I missed my chance to find a carved Maya king. But I did gain a lot of respect for the ancient Maya at that moment. How the heck did they transport those things? It took us four hours just to turn one over. Now, let me switch gears and talk a bit about camp life that season. In part, it was the same as the year before with the super elite having their private parties and me running the cinnabar out on the road. One of my weekly tasks was driving to the Mennonite community of Blue Creek to gas up the hoss. Unlike many other Mennonite communities in Belize, Blue Creek embraced machines. We called them mechanized Mennonites. We rented all of our trucks from them and gassed them up at their gas station. They also had a plane that we called Mennonite Air. For a hefty price, you could fly to Belize City or the Kays. All of the camp's supplies came from the grocery store at the gas station. Except for the beer. For that, we had to go all the way to Orange Walk. When I got gas, I also bought snacks to sell at my road bar. I also bought my own wheelbarrow, since Fred's growing displeasure with the Cinnabar had banned me from using the camps. One Saturday... When I was repairing my wheelbarrow near the lab, a red-faced student ran into camp straight to me, struggling to speak. She reached into her mouth, pulled out a golf ball of snot, and then screamed, Jaguar! Now, Fred's rule was that no one was ever to leave camp alone. But this girl was a runner, so she decided to run the two kilometers down to the ruins of La Milpa. When she arrived in front of its main pyramid, a jaguar suddenly jumped out of the looter's trench down its front staircase. She said that for a moment she froze, hearing that classic never-run advice in her head. But then she said, screw that, and she ran. And the jaguar pursued her. It loped behind her for a while, then it ran through the jungle keeping pace with her, and at one point it jumped in front of her. She screamed and it jumped back into the woods. It chased her all the way to near our camp, where she jumped into our disgusting watery trash pit, and when it left, she climbed out and she ran to camp. A couple of macho guys accused her of making it up, but jumped into a truck and sped down to La Milpa. Just as they arrived to the looter's trench, the jaguar leapt out again. But this time, she had a cub in her mouth. 
She wasn't trying to kill the girl. She was just protecting her baby. Sadly, I can't remember that girl's name. But whoever she was, I bet her life was never the same. Now, I can't end my 1996 camp stories without telling you about the strangest thing, or the strangest person, I should say, Neil Haskell. Dr. Neil Haskell was a forensic entomologist, a guy who worked with police cases by analyzing how bugs and maggots ate dead bodies. Even from a skeleton, he could tell you when it died, what season, and the positions of the wounds, and other things like that. He was there to try his hand at the ancient Maya skeletons. A big, tough-looking guy, he had a thick, gray mustache and bellowed nearly everything he said. He was also sure that the Russian mafia was after him for testifying against them in a Canadian court case. At one point, he called a slide projector a communist and threatened to shoot it. He had brought a few students with him who were mostly conducting macabre experiments watching dead pigs rot in the jungle. One night, one of those students approached me at my tent with an offer from Haskell. If I would give him a pot shirt from Mashna, he would give me a maggot out of David Koresh's body. My first reaction was, what the hell? But then curiosity took over and I had to ask, does he really have a maggot from David Koresh's body? Yes. He worked at the scene and he has several. I have to be honest, I contemplated it for a moment. But then I thought, I'd give him a fake shirt and he'd slip me a fake maggot and then I'd be just as weird as him. So I turned down Haskell's maggot and he didn't speak to me for the rest of the field season. But I digress. Back to the archaeology. I knew my time in Mashna's city center was ending. So every Friday was exploration day. We explored west and found hundreds more buildings, some of them quite large. I kept that under my hat as a way to stay in Mashna for another season, just not in the city center. Near the end of the season, my crew and I had gone for the weekend to a pretty little resort called Chan Chich. Another crew of archaeologists was there too, led by a friend of mine named Marilyn Masson. She and I were both grad students under Sheely back in Austin. She was shorthanded on the Earthwatch project that she was running and asked me to join after my PFB season. I thought, what the heck? I've already been gone for seven months. What's one more? So I joined Marilyn's crew excavating on an island in a lake called Laguna de On. We lived in the community center of the town of San Esteban, just north of Orange Walk, and boated to the island each day. It was fun work. I helped teach Earthwatch volunteers and got to dig a triple grave that we called the Bus to Shibalba. I got home to Austin in mid-August. My master's degree certificate was hiding in a huge pile of mail my brother had kept for me. Not 24 hours into my return, the phone rang again. This time it was my friend Kent Riley asking me if I wanted a temporary teaching position at Southwest Texas State University. One thing led to another, and a week later, I was standing as a professor in front of my first ever college class. I was teaching the archaeology of North America. What a year 1996 was for me. Looking back, I can't believe that many things happened to me in a single year. And little did I know it, but 1997 would be just as crazy. Okay, I'll take my final commercial break here, and when I return... We'll get into 1997. If you like the subject matter of this podcast, and clearly you do because you have to be at least 10 minutes in to hear this commercial, then I suggest you give The Great Courses a try. They're produced by The Teaching Company, a company who started over 30 years ago. They're kind of the OG of the autodidactic learning world. All those other online learning companies are really just copying what they started. They have hundreds of courses, not just individual lectures, but entire courses over every subject you could imagine. I myself have produced a few courses for them. 
they have this great new website called The Great Courses Plus. There you can stream audio or video all of their courses from any device you choose. Their website is www.greatcoursesplus.com. Check it out today and start your free trial. So in the fall of 1996, I'm a professor in San Marcos, but I'm also a Ph.D. candidate back in Austin. Fred Valdez is my advisor, and he knows that I'm still bent about being pulled from Mashna. So when Belize, which is a British commonwealth, asked him to make volunteer opportunities for an English organization called Raleigh International, he offered that manpower to me and my new Western Survey project. They required a very detailed plan of work, which I wrote up and provided. They accepted, and it was set. A group of some 20 young volunteers from Raleigh International would be my crew for one month. After teaching a second semester at Southwest, I was really ready to get back to the jungle. Truth be told, that job was kind of stressful. I had no slides. I had no prepared curriculum. All I had was a textbook. I had a meeting with the department chair, Jim Garber, about my worries, and he just looked at me and said, Ed, all you have to do is stay a lecture ahead of them. So that's what I did. Some student wrote in the professor reviews simply, Lighten up, Ed. What? Lighten up? I'm plenty light. That job was killing me. But in May, I was back in Belize. To my surprise, Fred informed me that Raleigh had already been there for two weeks and had set up their own camp at Mashna. I was to join them the very next day. They were coming down to camp to meet the incoming students and share a barbecue. Then I'd return to their camp with them. Oscar had bought a big pig to roast and wanted to get it going at dawn. Not wanting to shoot a gun that early and spook the sleeping students, he decided that he would kill the pig by hitting it in the head with a hand sledgehammer. Mike Stowe held it, and Oscar whacked it hard in the head. But it didn't die. Instead, it screamed, broke Mike's grip, and ran squealing through the camp. They chased it, tackled it, and hit it again. Still not dead still screaming. Then they cornered it. Whack! Scream! Whack! Scream! Whack! Silence. Finally, Oscar had beat that poor pig to death. Needless to say, the entire camp was awake and shook. It was a horrific thing. But the barbecue was nice. The Raleigh crew arrived that afternoon. All but their leaders were young, 16 and 17 years old. Nice English folks, and a few nice Belizeans, too. I gathered my gear in a tent and went up with them to Mashna. Their camp was well-organized, British military style, with a kitchen and a mess hall. That's not surprising, since Raleigh International is like the American Outward Bound, just more explicitly connected to the British Army. It was named after soldier and explorer Sir Walter Riley. I set up my tent and spent my first night. In the morning, some leaders from Belize City showed up with a PFB ranger and a few workers. They said they were there to help me with one of my goals in my plan of work, finding and searching the 240 meter tall peak, the tallest in the area. To my surprise, they wanted to hike out there and spend the night in hammocks. I had never done anything like that, but okay. The Raleigh's had been cutting logging roads open as per my plan, and one of them led to the base of the peak. We hiked up, seeing quite a few buildings along the way, and made it to the top about an hour before nightfall, just in time to eat and hang our hammocks. There weren't many buildings up there, which was a little disappointing, but that was not my main concern at that moment. Why the hell were we about to hang all night from trees like meat sacks in jaguar country? Was no one else concerned? Apparently not, especially based on the snoring the Brits did all night. I didn't sleep a wink, but dawn arrived and we were all still alive. After a quick 
breakfast of British military rations, the leader pulled out a map. A secret British map with the location of a nearby helicopter pad. Wait, there's been a helicopter pad out here the entire time? He explained that yes, the British government had them all along the Guatemalan border in case Guatemala decided to attack Belize. We hiked a relatively short distance to the overgrown pad. His workers cut it all back to about six inches tall, and then we returned to camp. I realized that exploring my peak was just a smokescreen to go maintenance that helicopter pad. The Brit told me that it was classified information, but here I am talking about it on a podcast. So, if I'm killed by a Gurkha next week, you'll have a good guess why. Anyhow, we returned to camp, the boss and his men left, and I was back with the Raleigh's. Their leader, David, explained that they had cut kilometers of logging road and survey lines, as I had instructed, but they had yet to find a single building. Yet more discouraging for them were the injuries. Many students had been torn up by the jungle, and a few had hacked their own legs with their machetes. Their third staff member, who they called Dave Medic, was working overtime. As for the lack of ruins... I suggested we walk their lines together so I could have a look. The next morning, we all followed the new logging roads down to one of their survey lines and followed it south. I was near the back of our single file line with the Raleigh's who cut the line in front. I watched as they walked along the flat jungle, up a five meter rise, and then down out of sight. As I followed them up and in and looked around, I called for the group to stop. We were standing in a wide patio of a raised elite residential group surrounded by four buildings. To the untrained eye, Maya ruined structures can really look like hills, but I explained where we were and what they had discovered. They were ecstatic. They thanked me profusely. Their leader suggested that they give me a Raleigh cheer, So they all chanted three times, Ra, Ra, Raleigh. It was kind of a surreal moment. But we continued forward, and we found more and more buildings. I stopped to show them how to spot them and how to map them. That night at camp, we celebrated. The Raleigh Ruins mapping project had officially begun. The next day, I broke them up into three groups and sent them down their lines to find and map buildings. I bounced back and forth between the groups to help keep them on track. And I quickly learned why they were all getting hurt. They were all dressed in shorts, t-shirts, and tennis shoes. I told them to dress in long sleeves and pants to avoid getting scratched up. But they replied that it was beastly hot and that they just couldn't. And they had also not been really trained with their machetes. So they always cut straight down in front of them, eventually cutting their own legs. A Raleigh would cut themselves. They would call Dave Medic, and he would run up. He would anesthetize them with a shot, and then stitch the wound, and then two more Raleigh's would carry that one back to camp. I found one boy sitting quietly in the jungle holding his leg. He said, I'm terribly sorry, Ed, but I seem to have cut myself rather badly. I said, uh, well, uh, let me see it. He took his hand off and blood spurted out like a punctured hose. I told him to put it back on again and just yelled, uh, Dave Medic! And off went three more of the rallies to camp. That evening, their leader made an adorable demonstration of how not to cut your leg, swishing his machete and repeating, Down and away, down and away. He promised everyone a beer back in Belize City if they could just stop cutting themselves. Unfortunately, they couldn't. One other really strange thing happened during my time with the Raleigh's. I call it the Rise of the Baldies. A group of boys, tough city boys, decided to shave all their hair off, right down to the scalp. They moved their tents from camp out into the jungle and began referring to the rest of the camp as hairy people. They still worked during the day, but at night they stayed out in the jungle. At dinner, they would run in yelling like it was a raid. They'd grab food like they were stealing it, and then they'd run back to their tents. 
One night, in the pouring rain, they raided the camp for cigarettes, stealing a pack from some girl and running back into the jungle. Things were getting a little Lord of the Flies, so honestly, I was a little bit relieved when they packed up and left. Rally International really did help my project, but definitely not in the way I expected. But when they left and I returned to the PFB camp, Fred had no students to spare for my work on the new area of buildings that I was now calling the Toknal Plateau. So instead, I volunteered to help another graduate student named Jeff Durst with his project at a site called Dos Hombres. It was interesting work. Durst had found a tomb, the top of which was covered by a big pile of obsidian flakes. But as soon as a new batch of students arrived, I was back out and mapping. We got a ton done. In just three weeks, we mapped over 300 buildings, and my Toknal Plateau community stretched all the way back to Mashna, which I knew it would. But at the end of the season, when I showed Fred my maps, he said that Toknal was clearly part of Mashna and that I would have to give that up too. And that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. I thought, hell, I am leaving this project and I'll start my own somewhere else. I had already planned to go to a conference called the Palenque Roundtable in Chiapas in July. But now I had an added purpose there, to find Richard Hansen and offer my services to his El Mirador project. I found him in Palenque and offered my mapping services in exchange for using his camp as a base of operations to find more undiscovered cities in the Paten. He kept saying that I could if I had the cojones to deal with five-meter-long crocodiles. I said that I didn't, but that I could probably hire someone from a local village with a gun and a need for crocodile boots. But then I found my buddy Christopher Powell, who had been working at Palenque with Merle Green Robertson and Alfonso Morales. The night before, he had been at a late-night tequila session with P Palenque's chief archaeologist and the head of Ina from Mexico City. The Ina boss was making fun of the archaeologist, saying, All these years, and you still have no good map of Palenque. The archaeologist started explaining how hard it was and his staff limitations when Christopher spoke up and said, Ed Barnhart's a great mapper, and he could do it. He'll be here this week at the conference. The boss said, well, good, Arnaldo, hire him and get it done. So just like that, I was the new mapper of Palenque. I went back to Austin and won a big grant from FAMPSI to do all the work. And I taught my final semester at Southwest. By January of 1998, I was living in Chiapas. The chapter of my archaeological career at Mashna had ended, and a new one at Palenque had begun. So... That concludes my storytelling for this podcast episode. I enjoyed it, and I hope you did too. Before I go, a programming note. Summer is my busiest time of the year. I plan to be in Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and hopefully Cambodia too. As such, I'm going to take a break from the podcast in June, July, and August. But I will be back, especially for those of you who support ArcheoEd through my Patreon. Please don't stop. My next episode will come out September 1st, and then they'll continue once a month just like usual. I haven't decided on the subject of September's episode yet, so feel free to send me some ideas. But until then, this is Ed Barnhart, signing off. You've been listening to Archeo Ed, a podcast written, produced, and distributed by me, Ed Barnhart. If you liked what you heard, then subscribe, like, share, comment, and do all those other things that I'm supposed to ask you to do. If you didn't, then don't do any of that stuff. And if you really liked it, support Archeo Ed through my Patreon account. I make these podcasts for free, but I am not opposed to financial support. Until next time, thanks for listening. All rights reserved. Copyright 2020.